Welcome to Thriller Vault, where thriller writers tell their favorite stories. I'm your host, Phil Williams. And tonight, I have a thrilling story for you titled, The Biggest Scam in the History of the World. The cold wind whipped through the New Jersey train station. Passengers queued at the sleeper cars and coach cars. Exterior paint peeled off the train cars, exposing some rust. Conductors took tickets from the passengers. The interior was likely just as drab. Rail travel in 1910 was much more utilitarian than luxurious. I hunched into the cold wind, tilting my head down. I carried my small suitcase, filled with enough clothes for a few days. My stay would be ten days, but they had promised uniforms to wear daily. At the end of the train was a lonely caboose, sitting still about fifty feet from the train and unconnected. This car was the polar opposite of the drab train cars in front. The black paint was fresh and glossy and accented with polished brass, handrails, knobs, and window frames. The shades were drawn, obscuring the interior. Aldrich was written across the side in gold paint. A tall man wearing a black overcoat and a black hat stood sentry by the elaborate train car. He narrowed his eyes at me as I approached. I said, I was told to meet here. I'm Charles Jefferson. I held out my hand. He stared at my hand with one side of his mouth raised. I knew that look of disgust very well. My dad taught me never to hold out my hand to a white man, but I was just as good as any man. I was educated in one of the grandest houses in New York City. My father was the butler, and the master of the house insisted that I be homeschooled along with his children. Of course, I couldn't go to boarding school with them, but I got the basics. That's all I needed to teach myself the rest. I'm glad my father's not alive to see what a disgrace I've become. I dropped my hand, and the man in black said, Follow me. The man in black showed me inside the train car. Brass wall sconces illuminated the luxurious accommodation. Plush leather armchairs formed a sitting area smelling faintly of cigars. Velvet drapes framed the windows. A full bar ran along one wall. A large mahogany table sat before the bar, the table legs intricately carved like lion paws. A kitchen was visible beyond the bar. A hallway led away from the dining and living area, likely the sleeping quarters. The man led me through the kitchen to the servants' quarters. The room was barely bigger than a closet, with bunk beds built into the wall. A small bathroom was across the hall. The man in black didn't have to tell me the rules but he made it clear that I was only to use that particular bathroom. I stowed my suitcase and changed into my uniform, which was a black suit with tails and white gloves. I used to complain to my father about the white gloves, ranting about the fact that white folks didn't want my black hands to touch anything they might touch. But my dad thought I needed to grow up. He told me about the white butlers and footmen who also wore gloves. I had said, then maybe they don't like poor people. My father had been a quiet, patient man, my polar opposite. I don't remember him ever losing his temper, but he did then. His entire body tensed. He pointed his craggy finger at me and said, You don't know poor boy. You've never worked from sun up to sun down in the fields without shoes. You've never missed a meal in your life. Your mother would be so disappointed, God rest her soul. My mother. She never meant anything to me. According to my father, she was an angel. They had been trying to have children for a decade before I finally came along. I was their miracle baby. But I wasn't a miracle. I was a curse. My first act on this earth was to kill my mother. After changing into my uniform, I met the other servant, George Young. Like his name, he was Young. I guessed he was about my age, in his mid-twenties. He had a long scar on his left cheek that I tried not to stare at, but not trying only made me stare more. George didn't seem to mind. He was a cook, which was good because that's where I was lacking. I had been a gardener, a footman, and a chauffeur, but never a cook. I can't believe I got this job, George said as he dressed into his uniform. I figured they'd want someone older. Me too, I replied not thinking about my age, but what I had done to lose my previous job as a footman. A friend of a friend helped me out, 
I continued. Good thing, too. I need the money. When I first told my wife that I'd be missing Thanksgiving, she was madder than a wet hen, George replied. Then I told her what they were paying, and she smiled and said we'd have the best December Thanksgiving ever. After we were presentable, George readied the kitchen and bar for drinks and snacks once the VIPs were aboard. I waited outside, ready to play the role of porter. The first VIP marched to the train car wearing a long fur-collared coat and a top hat. He used a silver-tipped walking cane that didn't appear necessary. A collection of porters carried his luggage, while a small, bespectacled man walked beside him, taking notes. The VIP looked familiar to me, but I couldn't place him. The porters left the luggage at my feet and retreated. The man in black told me to take the man's luggage to room one. I was not introduced to the man, but the man's secretary addressed him as Mr. Aldrich, to which Mr. Aldrich looked at his secretary with a look that could kill. The bespectacled secretary said, I'm sorry, sir, I forgot. I'm not used to using first names. As I made several trips with Mr. Aldrich's luggage, I snuck glances at the man. His face looked so familiar. The beady, deep-set eyes, the bushy white mustache. It wasn't until the next VIP arrived and called him Nelson that I put two and two together. Mr. Aldrich was Nelson Aldrich, the Republican whip in the Senate and the father-in-law to John D. Rockefeller Jr. Four more VIPs arrived shortly thereafter, all with extensive luggage. The men ignored me entirely. They addressed each other by their first names. Nelson, Abe, Ben, Frank, and Henry. They were all middle-aged to older white men. They all carried themselves like important men, confident and self-assured. Frank said, I am to be addressed as Orville. Henry smirked and replied, And I am Wilbur. This was an obvious homage to the famous Wright brothers and the inventors of their flying machine. The conductor from the train called out, All aboard! Nelson scowled and said, We are still waiting on Paul. As if on cue, a bald man with a bushy handlebar mustache marched toward the train car, carrying a shotgun case. The men greeted the final VIP, all using their first names only. Frank and Henry reiterated their Orville and Wilbur ruse. I worked quickly to carry Paul's luggage to his luxury room. The men entered the rail car and lounged on the leather armchairs. George took their drink orders. A double blast came from the train engine whistle. I looked through the front window by the kitchen, watching the train chug away from the station. I thought for sure the train would connect us before leaving. But then, the train stopped and reversed, coming back to the station and connecting our luxury caboose with a slam of the couplers before pulling out of the station again. I doubted any of those passengers knew that they had VIPs in their caboose. The rest of the day and night had been busy, catering to the every whim of the six VIPs. It was just George and me with them. The man in black and even the various personal assistants and secretaries had been left behind. I tried to glean information about these men from their conversations. They talked about hunting, making fun of Paul, the man who had brought the shotgun case, Paul had laughed along with the good-natured ribbing and said, I have never even fired a shotgun. They talked about Wall Street and banking. They talked a lot about banking procedures and policies, enough to make most men's eyes glaze over. But these six men were animated and excited about finance. It didn't take a detective to figure these VIPs were likely wealthy bankers and financiers. I had been taught to distrust banks, preferring to keep my cash in my mattress My father had been wiped out twice in bank runs over the years, the first time in 1873 and then again in 1893. He proudly had his cash buried in the backyard during the 1907 panic. The next afternoon, as the train neared Raleigh, North Carolina, it slowed and stopped just outside the station terminal. Train crewmen threw a switch at the tracks and the train engine reversed, pushing the caboose onto a siding. Then. The crew disconnected the caboose, and the train pulled away into the station at Raleigh. When the passengers unloaded at the Raleigh station, their train looked the same as it had when they'd boarded in New Jersey. Most, if not all of them, had no idea about the caboose they'd towed. 
They were picked up by another train and pulled to Atlanta, then to Savannah, and finally Brunswick, Georgia, which was a small fishing village on the Atlantic coast with a port that traded in cotton and lumber. The next morning, the Aldrich train car was parked in a siding at the Brunswick station. It stuck out like a sore thumb at the small rural station. It didn't take long to stir the local media as the VIPs sipped their morning coffee enjoying the sea breeze through the open windows. I moved the mountain of luggage to four awaiting cars. The VIPs exited the train car and I grabbed my own suitcase. I glanced out the window of my tiny bedroom and I saw a man jogging toward the VIPs. He held a notepad and pen in hand. I figured he was a reporter. The reporter spoke to Henry, a.k.a. Wilbur, just outside my window. Mr. Davison, Jake Cross with the New Brunswick Herald, why are you here with Senator Aldrich? The other VIPs hurried to the cars, their heads bowed and shielded with their hats. Henry Davison was a thin-lipped man with squinty eyes, a rigid posture, and a white hat atop his head, the brim as rigid as his spine. Henry said, We are here to duck hunt on Jekyll Island. It's just a little vacation among friends. The reporter narrowed his eyes. Friends, huh? Sounds unlikely. You have two government officials cozying up with heads of various banks, not to mention those banks are supposed to be competitors in a free market. Henry clenched his jaw for a split second. We set aside our work life to come together as friends. The reporter smirked. I don't think the American public will see it that way. What do you want? I have everything I need. Senator Aldrich, chairman of the National Monetary Commission, you, Mr. Davison, senior partner at J.P. Morgan, Abraham Pyatt Andrew, assistant treasury secretary, Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank, Benjamin Strong, head of J.P. Morgan, and Paul Warburg, a partner in Kuhn and Loeb. I'd say I have it all. Who tipped you off? Henry asked. The reporter chuckled. A good reporter never reveals his sources. Henry gritted his teeth. What do you want? The way I figure it, the six of you represent about a quarter of all the wealth in the world. And if you're fraternizing, it isn't for the good of humankind. Henry reached into his inside jacket pocket and showed the man a handful of gold coins. He said, you have a choice. You can take this gold and forget what you saw today, or you can write your story, but beware, a quarter of the world's wealth wields more power than you can imagine. Is that a threat? Of course not. It is simply a friendly warning. If you print your story, it will go no further than your local circulation. The people I represent own all the major newspapers. They will make sure you never work in the newspaper business ever again. They will bury you and your family in civil lawsuits. Henry held out the gold. What will it be, Mr. Cross? The reporter took the gold and skulked away. We drove the cars onto the ferry. We were the only ones going to Jekyll Island. After a short boat ride from the mainland, we arrived at the Jekyll Island dock. We drove off the ferry beyond the beach past inland marshes, through a subtropical forest, and finally to the front gate of the rural hotel. Armed guards ushered us through the front gate. The Jekyll Island Club was a grand hotel with an expansive lawn, palm trees, flowers, and a turret that made the hotel appear castle-like at one end. I was hoping for more help at the hotel, but we only added one more servant, Wilson, an ancient man who told us what to do more than he lessened the workload. I can still picture him with his hands on his hips, watching and critiquing our every move. That night, in George's servants' quarters, I tried to talk to him about what I'd seen and heard earlier that day. Did you see that reporter at the train station in New Brunswick? I asked. George shrugged. I saw two white men talking. Don't know what they was talking about, and I don't care. Ain't none of my business. I recapped the conversation as best I could. George eventually held up his hand and said, That's white folk business. It don't concern me. It concerns everyone who has a bank account. Everyone who has a dollar in their pocket. Who knows what they could do? These men represent a quarter of all the wealth in the world. What do you think they're doing here? 
Like I said, it don't concern me. I'm here to do a job and get paid. Then I'm going to go home to my wife and my baby, and we're going to have the best December Thanksgiving. Turkey and stuffing with all the fixings. Pumpkin pie, cherry pie, apple too. Hell, I'm going to buy every type of pie they got. I went back to my room. I tossed and turned that night, thinking about what these VIPs were up to. When I have trouble sleeping, it's usually because there's something important that I need to do or remember. Maybe I was supposed to remember what that reporter had said. So I wrote their names in my notebook and what I knew about them, most of the information coming from the reporter. Then I finally drifted off to sleep. At dinner the next evening, I delivered drinks to the smoking lounge. The lounge was filled with brown leather furniture, ornate lamps, and dark wood walls. The air was thick with cigar smoke. I tried to glean as much as I could from their conversation, slowly handing out the whiskey. Henry puffed on his cigar and said, Competition is the biggest problem. Over the past 10 years, the number of banks in the U.S. has doubled to over 20,000. They're stealing our market share. If this continues, Henry shook his head. It's in all of our best interest that this trend is reversed as soon as possible. I agree, Benjamin Strong said, gesturing to Henry, his colleague at J.P. Morgan. We must tilt the market in our favor. Ben had a stern face with deep laugh lines and a full head of dark hair. It's not just competition from small banks, Frank Vanderlip said the president of National City Bank. Industry is becoming more and more self-sufficient. They are financing their operations from profits, not debt. If we can indebt industry and the consumers, we will own everything. That is the problem with the U.S., Henry said. People are too frugal and they don't trust the banks. Too many immigrants with a strong work ethic and an under-the-mattress mentality when it comes to money and credit. Frank downed his whiskey and said, We need control over the interest rates. If we can lower interest rates, people will borrow more. Frank jiggled his glass to me. This is also why we need to do away with the gold standard. We need total control of the money supply. I walked to Frank and filled his whiskey glass. That is risky, Senator Aldrich said. You risk destroying the currency. You risk bank runs. You risk the collapse of the entire banking system, not to mention the economy. I left the room, but I lingered just outside with an empty glass pressed to the door to magnify their voices. Not if there was a central bank, Paul Warburg of Kuhn and Loeb said. Ideally, we create a central bank that is endorsed and protected by the federal government to protect our interests, to keep competition minimal, and to bail out our members during the inevitable panics using taxpayer money. Then, if we can detach from the gold standard, if we can control the money supply, we'll be able to keep the panics to a minimum. Why would the U.S. government help us? Ben asked. Because we'll provide the government with unlimited currency to protect and grow government power, Paul Warburg said. Imagine having unlimited funds, Senator. We'll have to transition from the gold standard to a fiat currency system to do that, Senator Nelson Aldrich replied. At what cost? Assistant Treasury Secretary Abraham Andrew asked. Detaching from the gold standard would unleash unlimited government spending and create massive inflation. It would steal purchasing power from every citizen who has a dollar in their pocket. The average citizen has no concept of inflation, Henry said. If we can keep it low enough, say under 3%, nobody will notice. At 3% compounded inflation, that's effectively confiscating half of the value of every dollar in circulation every 14 years, Abe said. Henry laughed. Our banks will be the biggest buildings in every major city in this country. Everyone else loses. Abe said. The men all laughed. We can't say that it's a central bank. It'll never pass, Abe said. You are correct, Frank Vanderlip said. I was thinking we could call it 
the Federal Reserve. To the public, it sounds like it is part of the government and that we are actually holding reserves. What are you doing? Wilson asked. I whipped around and dropped the whiskey glass on the wood floor. The glass shattered. The old servant glared at me, his bony arms crossed over his chest. Wilson said, I need to talk to you. In the kitchen. Now. I cleaned up the glass and hurried to the kitchen, my heart still thumping in my chest. I dropped off my tray and empty glasses at the bar with George, then went to the kitchen. I know what you were doing, Wilson said. I wasn't, Wilson cut me off. I was born at night, but not last night. You know why you're making three times what a footman makes anywhere else? I dipped my head. Wilson continued, because we're here to serve. That's it. We're not concerned about their affairs. In fact, we're paid not to notice their affairs. Wilson stuck a craggy finger in my face, reminding me of my father. Do I need to send you home? No, sir. That's the end of part one of the biggest scam in the history of the world. Tune in next week for the exciting conclusion. Thank you so much for watching Thriller Vault. 